the art of coding or with other words is coding art. Well, there is a definition of art that can follow um, from Wikipedia. I also put a lot of Wikipedia um, citations that says, you know, art is a range of human activities or the product thereof that involve, now that's important, creativity, I would say, technical proficiency, beauty, emotional power, or conceptual ideas. And here we see some typical products. Some are prints, some are handmade stuff or carved out things. Yeah, I would say art is something that is very subjective. And therefore, I don't want to actually judge if I like this or not. Some of you may like them, some of you don't. That's okay. And that's the same for this talk, talk today. So now let's compare this a little bit with programming. So what is programming? Well, it's the process of designing and building an executable computer program for a specific computational result or to perform a particular task. So if you compare those two things, you know, it's, you know, there's maybe one word that might remind us of, of art, which is designing, right? Art and designing seems to be a little bit of compatible, but in general, they are very disjoint. However, what I want to convince you as part of this um, talk is, well, there is a lot of analogy between those things. And let's get started with something easy. Can we use computer technology for arts? Of course. Digital art, for instance, is a work of practice that uses digital technology as part of creative or presenting process. So you create digital images, music, 3D printers for sculpturing, right? And you do digital image enhancement, AKA Photoshopping. We have interactive installations, robotic assisted arts. And for those digital arts, you can actually get awards, which means they are somehow recognized at least by a set of people. So let's start with digital arts a little bit. So photo ma manipulation for surreal arts. I would say they blur the line between photography and computer generated imagery. So I, is this arts already? So we have certainly here two photographs that are well stitched above each other. I would say at least it's somehow interesting. Then we have other images where we have surreal arts, such as this one, which I personally find highly appealing. Um, and it's clear that this is surreal. Um, and I can absolutely recommend to you all this guy, Eric Johansen. He has a lot of this beautiful kind of uh, canvases hanging around, not always, you know, on the moon side, but I would say they are bright, the bright side. Okay, so overall, I would say the role of the artist certainly is changing things to digital technology. So, and the key question I had when I made this talk was, what is the techni technical proficiency of the artist? And what is the role of the toolbox used? Somehow that changed over the course of decades and centuries. Nowadays, algorithms aid or replace technical proficiency, right? I remember 20 years ago, I could, you know, I had to use a lot of pixel art to um, stitch together images and fake people putting people's heads into some posters of some uh, stars or something like that. Nowadays, it's very simple and you can automate that using AI. Also nowadays, thanks to computer technology, we can, and the cheap ways of producing such um, imagery, we can um, do rapid trial and error there with creativity is maybe something, oh, I like that image out of 100 or something. So it gets kind of less, important. So that was a little bit a negative side, I would say, but maybe it's not that negative in that sense, but it was on that side. However, I would say technology empowers everyone to become an artist nowadays. It's cheap to start. You don't have to buy ex ex expensive canvas or anything. You can just do it in the digital. You have a lot of open source tools available to do music, to do arts of any kind. And the tools that you get nowadays are much more sophisticated than before. Basically, everyone, even a child, can how they, you know, do their own selfie editing, right? Which was something that is barely possible in the past. So that means for me, the definition of an artist changed. The lines get blurred. What was difficult in the past and really technical proficiency was required, nowadays is something everyone could do. So that may change everything. Now let's look at coding. And there's one branch of coding that is recognized as being 
artistic, which is the so-called creative coding. So in that type of programming, the goal is to create something expressive instead of something functional. Well, I would argue that some computer programs that should be functional are in fact somehow expressive and they're crashing, but that's something different. Um, with creative coding, you can do live visuals, which is also used for VJing, which is basically a visual jockey similar to this jockey now, now the, back then you can nowadays create live visuals and, and light arts and stuff uh, for installations. So now having equipped with all that knowledge, let's look at the Wikipedia definition again. So we have creative VT, technical proficiency, beauty and emotional power and concepts or conceptual ideas. Which of those do you think are not relevant for programming? What do you think? So I think all of them that are highly relevant. So in that sense, are programmers artists? Yeah, creative imagination is needed to visualize the product or algorithm. Technical proficiency, of course, you need to know what you are doing with coding, except if you are script kitty. But uh, if you do something serious, of course, you need to know the arts of coding. Beautifulness. Many programmers care how the code looks like. And I would say there is, um, if you look at maintainability, if you look at code and you say, oh my God, that is so horrible code. Typically that is somehow correlated with maintainability. If the code looks very clean and understandable, you often associate that as a programmer with being beautiful. But beautiful can mean other things too, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And lastly, let's look at emotional or conceptual ideas. So what is conceptual when it deals with abstract or original thoughts? I would say a lot of programs are original, right? So they could be considered that. Can they be emotional? Yes, computer games can be emotional if you win, if you lose. And other programs cause emotions too. I would say WinWord or stuff like that, that crashes after you've spent two hours without saving they cause emotions, not necessarily good ones. And um, certainly I would also say not everything is art, right? Because for example, replicating an existing program means it's not original. Yeah, the 100 Flappy Bird clone is not quite original. So you want to scrap that being art. Some of these codings are recognized, like I mentioned, creative coding is recognized and the demo theme it's kind of a computer art subculture. So what we will do as the remaining part of uh, today's talk, just a sec, is that we look at examples of different types and value the beauty of the overall creation, which is the algorithm and the representation and the generated output by the algorithm. And by we look at particularly at the beauty of code, which means it can be artistically arranged, it can be elegant, and whatever the need means, it can be minimal code, which is beautiful too, our optimal performance optimized code, and the way code or instructions are kind of placed and look like can be also beautiful. Well, of course, as we progress through these examples, we will see technical proficiency, creative imagination, and conceptual ideas. Um, therewith, ticking all the boxes, showing that this can be art, at least for me. So let's get started with coding TV. So I take a couple of examples from the obfuscated code contest, um, which is an international contest annually held. Um, basically, you can hand in C code that is obfuscated what it does, creatively arranged, and it has a certain goals I'm showing some of these aspects that I list here, which I don't read. Um, so here's an example, wins. Um, so what does this code look like? Well, actually it looks like a cube here. So this code does what this code looks like. It renders a cube and uh, uh, let me go here. Um, so there we go. That's the cube that's rendered in this little program. Um, yeah, okay. So that was a very easy start. We have code that looks like what it does. Um, yeah, okay. Um, let's look at this one. Um, it's JavaScript. So this looks like a donut. And uh, I find it also, it's quite small. Um, it's quite small code. Um, so let me push start what this JavaScript code does. It does that. 
I would say this is kind of cool, having this little code that looks like what it does, sort of, albeit it's difficult to read. So it's a little bit of different readability. Yeah. And it's, I think it's good. Again, you can have your own opinion. So then we have this one. Now, now from the um, code contest again. So here, this is the way the code is Aaron, um, arranged. And you, it looks like a, a face, right? A human face here. And this actually, this algorithm, this Akari algorithm is, it down samples a text file, an ASCII art file basically into lower resolution. So, and what is this like the code is arranged into? It's an ASCII art of a face. So of course we can co compile this code, run it on itself, and then it produces a minimal version of the code that looks like that, which is not runnable, not compilable in that sense, but it, it kind of looks, you know, the same as the big picture. And you can run it again and again. I think that's cool, good idea. It ticks a couple of boxes. Next, we have a couple of code that, you know, it looks really nice, right? So you see a couple of vectors here, and you can use this code, albeit it's very small. It does, without using libraries, um, create this very nice um, image, whatever text you put in, in it shows here, with um, reflection and so forth. I think that's pretty good for this small amount of code, and it looks nice. So the output is nice. The code looks nice. Well, it's not maintainable in this case anymore, but it does look cool. And then we have other artistic things that are more on the conceptual side. So this one here um, is kind of a homage on René Magritte's This is not a pipe French painting. Um, so this is here kind of the frame that we see. And we see here, this is not a function. And of course, there is a function, right? Um, you know, printf does, and there are a lot of stuff here going on. And if you compile this code and run it, it produces this. This is not a pipe. So I think there is clearly some indication um, and relationship of conceptual ideas here. Um, okay. Next, we talk about limitations. Um, I think a lot of coding art that you find is inspired by resource limitations of early systems. By that, I mean compute power, size, or graphics. Even in earlier times, there were computers, I mean, the Adelisa you know, that had stuff such as four colors were, were only possible and, and things like this. And an example system that I was the first computer that I had was the C64, eight bit machine with 64K um, byte of memory, and it had 16 colors. And this demo scene um, aims to show the capabilities of such machines under these resource limitations. Mm. Yeah, there are nowadays a lot of awards for those. And I would say a lot of programmers nowadays can't imagine such limitations, which is why it's very cool um, to think about them and have them in their mind, how hard it can be and how, how many things we can produce with such limited code. And there is a couple of awards. For example, if you have only X bytes of storage or memory available, there's 32 byte code um, limitation and 128 and you know, up, I have an example for 64K byte. Let's look at some of these um, examples. Um, so this here is actually just 32 byte assembler that includes, you know, loading and everything that you need to make it a program under MS-DOS. And if you run this, it shows this. And it's actually quite smooth. Um, I think it's pretty cool for two, 32 bytes of code. Now then, um, I could show bigger ones, but I wanted to show one example of a 64 kilobyte limitation. And it was um, done by this, by this group here. And it has actually music. And it's actually quite smooth. Again, thanks to big blue button. I cannot transfer that in real time. And uh, you can see it does stuff, right? It has this nice scenery here. And the sound, you know, it could be nice. We have a triforce and stuff for Marsh. And actually, it has some pop arts um, or internet memes, right? Here is Nyan Cat and such. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on. It has certain loops. 
with refined stuff. At last, you get this one. Uh, I think it's hard to see, but actually, depending on the music, it is kind of showing the volume of the music, right? So, kind of the beat where, where the houses are illuminated or not. So, um, I don't know how it's called, you know, for way, when you look at the waveform, basically, of the music. I, I think this is for 64 kilobyte. That, that, you know, it... I don't know how they basically did this, but um, I would say this is absolutely um, astonishing. And this group, Razor, I remember when, when I played Maniac Mansion on my um, T64 40 years ago, this group already existed. And back then they were in this cracking scene. Um, so it's quite cool. Nowadays they use their energies and ambitions to produce these artful things. And pretty good. I find this nice. Then there is this for limitations. Also a cool category is boot sector games. Um, what is that? So the master boot record of a PC has 512 bytes, sector zero. And you put in a CD, uh, uh, sorry, a disc or a storage media. And there are games that just need these 512 bytes. So the game must bring, because of the operating system, limitations There is known. It basically boots from, from BIOS directly into the game you have to bring these responsible parts of the operating system, such as drivers, that you need for the game with you. Um, I think that's pretty cool. And I had the the um, Space Invaders. There is a version, and this is actually a little bit um, slow. It has its issues due to the 512 bytes. And you can actually play this. So this is, um, I think, very nice for 512 bytes. Right. Um, there have been in early times also so-called booter games in the 90, 1980s um, that you could directly boot into, so it didn't need MS-DOS or anything. It was quite cool. Um, nowadays, that's, you don't find that anymore. But those were bigger. They could use a full disk or multiple disks. Okay. So let's leave limitations behind. Let's look at algorithms and code. So algorithms can be beautiful, elegant, they can be short and simple. And here I wanted to show a couple of wonderful visuals produced by mathematical sets, recursive algorithms, or simple rule-based systems. So one is the Mandelbrot set, which is widely known for its beauty, where you look at a set of complex numbers um, that you, you count, how often they can recursively run this function on itself until it basically explodes. And this number of iterations gets then um, scaled and printed so that you, it gets a different color. And uh, if it never explodes, you get also a different number of iterations. So I have also created one of these about 10 years ago. And here's two rendered examples um, that just follow the sim very simple rules. Um, here for this number, minus three, uh, 0.39 and so on, plus 0.6 imaginary part. And this is a multicolor version of it. Ah, I find this pretty cool. And actually, the Mandelbrot set is amazing because it's one of these things when you um, you can iterate over them and you can infinitely refine it, and you would get more and more detail. And it basically repeats and it never ends. It becomes always quite cool. So here's a video um, that shows what happens if you zoom into the Mandelbrot at a specific section. And this can go on and go on forever. And you can always find more and more of these awesome structures. For me, it's like moving through um, the space. Yeah, you, you space is infinite, and so is the Mandelbrot set if you refine it and go into it. Yeah, and here we see, here's again the bundle put set to some extent. And we go in again and we see it's more and more artistic. Yeah, I find this um, pretty, pretty nice. Otherwise I would show it, of course. Okay, yeah, and now let's stop because we could watch this forever, as I said. So,
Then last thing I brought is Conway's Game of Life, um, which a lot of you may know. Uh, it's a cellular aut automaton designed by um, Conway in 1970s, and it's basically a 2D grid in which you have disjoint cells, and each cell uh, follows very simple rules. You have a couple of rules, and the cell can either be alive or it can be dead, basically, and um, it can change. And based on that very simple three basic simple rules, um, you, you can get balance that emerge, such as still lives. Okay, that sounds not very tough, but you can get moving patterns, um, the, such as the spaceship, and you can get oscillating, repeating, or replicating patterns. And that's also, you can very, I think, very interesting. So let me move on. So here we have basically a generator that sends some of these, I think, spaceships around, and then they hit each other and eliminate themselves, and then you can build bigger structures, right? And here we have some patterns that re repeat and move at the same time. I mean, that's awesome, right? And uh, you can have things that, we, I think we did, um, that basically grow and uh, render new styles, which is this one. And uh, I think it's, you can generate actually text. Here still lives. Um, here it is. You can have some generators that produce some text repeatedly. Yeah, so they are their own machines and can produce very artistic results. Okay, next move to creative coding tools. There are tools that allow us to be more artistic. And one is Nanu. It's an open source creative coding framework for Rust. And what does it do? Well, it simplifies the creation of animations, audio, laser, and light shows. Okay, I was particularly intrigued about those last pieces. So how can we compose some artistic and show it to the world in big shows? Yeah, here I show a little bit how to do animations. There is nothing special. That is typical Rust code here. Um, so we get a little bit of stuff to set it up. And we want to um, draw a tunnel of rectangles, it says. And now there's a loop to draw these individual rectangles. Let's look, have a look how we draw the rectangles. Yeah, we have to define a rotation, a hue, and a color, and so on. And then we draw this rectangle, and we do here some function chaining to do so. And we fill it. And then we fill some text. OK, so that looks, you know, it plots a little bit of text and so on. And you may say, yeah, that, you know, I don't believe that's actually quite cool. So let me run it. So that's the final result. Yeah, I would say, I, I couldn't have guessed that from looking at the code, um, not completely at least. It's actually pretty cool. And that's done with this very few lines. And of course we can use it for laser installations. And so I prepped, here's the web page. So, um, there has apparently been an installation, and they have used it to render these images, not only on the screen, but to render some images here and you now to this laser show, right? And such as here, here, and that stuff. I mean, I think it's pretty cool um, to be able to do that. So thanks to Rust and open source, we could do it. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about live coding. So a live arts performance. Um, we, have, we have talked about this role of visual jockey, and but you can produce digital media, some graphics, you can produce light shows, computer music. Typically, you use some kind of library, and then you start to mix things together. In earlier times, there have been trackers. Um, I remember this from C64 time, where you could or orchestrate basically small sound clips to produce great music. Nowadays, you do audio live coding with stuff such as Super Collider and Extempore. There's a link to YouTube later. And what I wanted to show quickly is a visual live coding with Hydra. So therefore, I have to <clears throat> hide me here. So what is Hydra? It's a coding language that uses function chaining, and uh, it can be done in the browser. It has a couple of output buffers, supports webcams, remote source, and so on. And let's let's have a look. So here's a very simple 
well, code all commented out. Let me load a camera with the webcam and take it as an input and output it on output channel zero, which is typically printed. Oops. Now I can basically push control and enter. And what you see is me, obviously, right? Because that's what I did here in the code. So now let me change it. Let me load another video, this one here, which I can, and then output it to show you what it does. So this is a couple of, I don't know how these things are called in English. Um, they live in the Z. Right, and now what you can do is you can mix those things together. So let's take my video and subtract this video. So here you go. Right now, is this already artistic or not, right? Um, not quite sure. It was quite simple to produce. I think it's at least cool and my kids believe so too. And they can bring us a little bit to the coding because it's not much code that we need to write to do so. And uh, there are, of course, more sophisticated examples. So let me put this here in. So what we do, we, we take our source and then we multiply it to 0 0.5 to basically make the thicker a little bit weaker. And then we add a kaleidoscope effect and then we you know, generate the output. So here we go, that's the result. So this is a box that I put in front. And this is my face. You can still recognize my face on my fingers, right? So that's pretty cool. And I can, of course, you can see here this fancy, you know, video still playing in a kaleidoscope fashion. Now I could just remove this video if I wanted and take the original. That's basically the original video. They could recognize a little bit what that was. That was a box. Okay. All right. So you can do those kind of things. And uh, of course, you can do more right here. We can add multiple channels, rotate it at the same time. Let me do a little bit more. And then lastly, render it. Copy and paste this. Ah. Right, so here let's blend O0 with O0, rotate this whole thing, create a kaleidoscope effect, multiply it, and let's, I didn't, didn't do O1 yet. Let me then output it. So here we go. Okay, here we go. So uh, that's still me, that's still my fingers. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty cool for someone, you know, having that as an installation somewhere, play with it. That's still this box. Um, okay, let me show again how this box actually looked like because you may not, I have not shown it before. So that's that was the box that I showed you. And I think it's quite, you know, actually quite cool. All right, lastly, I wanted to quickly talk about aesthetic languages. So some programming languages are designed to be pleasing for the reader, such as Chef, where you formulate code as recipe, as Rockstar. I think, didn't we have a talk here about Rockstar a while ago um, at the OSSG? I think so. Uh, where you have algorithms as lyrics and Pete, where you have an algorithm as an image. They are often considered to be esoteric languages. Um, I think they are pretty cool because they look like something familiar from a different domain and they are executable code. Here we have a hello world um, from Chef. We have ingredients, we have some comment, and we have a method how to put things in a bowl. And if we call serves one, it actually prints hello world. That's the way we define the variables and so on. I think this is quite a little bit repetitive here. We always see put something into the mixing bowl, put something into the mixing bowl and so on. So they could make it nicer with some more variation, but that's what we find with Rockstar. There you have uh, different commands such as shout, say, or whisper, and they kind of are the same thing, basically printing something out. This is the code for FizzBuzz. 
um, which means if you divide by three, print fizz. If it's dividable by five, print buzz. And if it's dividable by 15, basically print fizz buzz. I think that was the definition of it. Um, and uh, this is pretty cool. And I think we had here the talk on this very same channel. And uh, I, I was very much intrigued when he heard the story how um, posting this, some code snippets on, on GitHub after coming from home from the pub um, caused that the next day they will have a couple of pull requests and questions to the very same GitHub um, where they asked, you know, the language is not quite working. I tried to implement this and which made the author of this very much surprised and it's really cool a lot of interpreters nowadays for Rockstar. Now to the speed um, which is a language where based on the difference in who and um, the how is it called the light that you can see here in uh, the opcode and the value so we have a counter that moves here through this image and then performs certain um, op codes and once it goes in in such a internal structure such as here it basically cannot get out again and then it, the code terminates so this code here prints hello world there are different artistic images that print hello world but that is one representation of it and i find it very cool the idea that you can go to rooms um, with your smartphone instead of having just a qr code reader you have a interpreter for pete you photograph a photo and it does say hello world. How cool is that? And here you have another code that calculates pi. Um, yeah. And you can put this as an image and it's quite nice. I find. Okay, to wrap up. Art covers creativity, technical proficiency, beauty, emotional power or conceptual ideas. And I would say our computer technology empowers people to become artists and open source empowers people to become artists nowadays. You can produce traditional art products thanks to open source, and you can produce new types of interactive and live art too. And I would say programmers can be artists too, but similarly that every, every image that you look at, that you just paint in five seconds or something, not every code is artistic. Now there are artistic codes and, that are, and others that are not that valuable. And I would strongly say that our computer science profession influences society or culture a lot. And uh, that makes this really awesome, the job that we have. And as an outlook, I would ask our computer artists, well, by definition, artists have to be humans. They cannot be animals or computers. But this might change over time that because driven by AI met methods, we see the creation of music, text, and images and also, of course, the application of artistic styles on existing material. So in that sense, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. And I brought one final item with me, a bash um, script that renders this little tree. Is it artistic? I don't know. I found it certainly beautiful what you can do with open source tools. And with that, thank you very much.